Hi again and welcome back. In this video we're going to be looking at the accusative case. This is the second last of the noun cases we're going to be looking at, so we're getting quite far along with our nouns. The accusative case is going to help us give a target for the action. The accusative case is the fourth that we've seen. So far we've seen three noun cases, the nominative, the genitive, and the vocative. We need this accusative case to help us in using verbs, because the accusative shows us which nominal is the direct object of the verb. That is, the accusative case shows us the person, place, or thing that is the target of the action the verb expresses. What is the direct object? It's the primary target of the verb's action. Some verbs don't need a direct object, and we call these intransitive verbs because the action has no target. Some intransitive exa examples in English would include the sentence, he jumps. The jumping here doesn't target anything, it's just a person jumping. Or the sentence, we run. Here the running doesn't have any particular target, it's just an activity that we participate in. Other verbs, though, need a target for the action. We call these transitive verbs. The direct object, then, is the target of the action of these transitive verbs. In English, some transitive examples would include the sentence, he buys a coffee, where a coffee is the target of the buying. Or we chase the ball, where the ball is the target of the chasing. A coffee and the ball are each the direct object in those clauses. Here are the basic singular accusative case endings. In the uh, second declension and first declension, the accusative is formed just by adding new at the end. Uh, in the third declension, the basic case ending for the accusative singular is alpha, but some words we're going to see, some uh, classes of third declension nouns use new, uh, almost like the first and second declension. But generally you should think of uh, first and second declension new in the accusative, uh, third declension alpha. If we add on to those endings the uh, connecting vowel, then in the second declension in the masculine and the neuter, the omicron connecting vowel comes in front of the new, so we get an on ending. And again, where sometimes masculine and neuter uh, endings are different in, in the second declension, in the accusative they usually look the same uh, on. The first declension uses either the eta or the alpha connecting vowel uh, to yield an ending that looks like either ain or on. And of course, in the third declension there is no connecting vowel, and so we just have the alpha uh, tacked onto the end, or in a couple of uh, third declension types, the new. So this is what those endings look like on some familiar nouns. Uh, the accusative singular form of logos is logon, with the omicron connecting vowel and new. The uh, first declension noun paidiske becomes paidiskein, in the accusative singular, and thura becomes thuran. The second declension neuter noun technon uh, becomes technon in the accusative singular, and you'll notice that with the neuter nouns that on ending was also used in the nominative singular, and this is a pattern that we're going to see with neuter nouns across the board, that the nominative and accusative forms with neuter nouns tend to be the same. In the third declension, meter becomes metera. We have a change in the stem to reveal the real stem, meter, but then we just add the alpha on the end of that. Similarly, the real stem of pais is paid, and we add the alpha so that the accusative singular form is paida. Uh, polis is one type that uh, uses the new ending in third declension. And so the accusative singular of polis is Pauline, and similarly the accusative singular of ichthus is ichthun. 
In the accusative plural, the second declension masculine ending is us, uh, upsilon sigma. The first declension uh, feminine accusative plural is just sigma. And the second declension neuter is alpha. So although, although the accusative singular endings were the same for the masculine and neuter second declension, in the plural they become different. Us for the masculine, a uh, alpha for the neuter. In the third declension, for masculine and feminine third declension nouns, the ending is as. And for neuter third declension nouns, the ending is just alpha, a, uh, which is just like the uh, accusative plural ending for second declension neuter nouns. So this is one place where uh, gender uh, plays more of a role than uh, declension does, uh, at least as far as the accusative plural ending goes. When we add in the typical connecting vowels, uh, the second declension masculine ending becomes us, omicron, upsilon, sigma. The first declension feminine ending becomes as, with the typical alpha connecting vowel that's used consistently in the first declension plural, plus the sigma. The second declension neuter uh, accusative plural ending is just a. Uh, there's no uh, other connecting vowel in front of it. And in the third declension, we have no connecting vowels, so we just have as in the masculine and feminine and a uh, for the neuter. Now, a couple of things to notice. Once again, the alpha ending uh, is used for the accusative neuter plural, both in the second and in the third declension. And also the as ending uh, that is typical of the first declension is the same as, it looks the same as the as ending that's used by both masculine and feminine third declension nouns. So that means that it's important to keep in mind what declension your noun is, because when you see that as ending, it might make you think, ah, this is a first declension feminine noun, but you have to remember if it's a third declension noun, that as ending could be on a masculine uh, noun as well as a feminine noun. And here's what those complete endings look like on some common uh, accusative plural nouns. The accusative plural of logos becomes logus. Uh, the accusative plural of paidiske becomes paidiskas. The accusative plural of technon becomes tekna. The accusative plural of meteras, uh, of uh, meter, sorry, uh, becomes meteras, which is the real stem meter plus the as ending. And the uh, accusative plural form of pneuma is pneumata. Again, that pneumat, real stem, plus the alpha, neuter ending. So let's compare the case endings for the first and second declension nouns. In the masculine second declension, in the singular, we have logos for the nominative, logu, now logon for the accusative, and loge for the vocative. The second declension masculine plural endings are logoi, logon, now logus, and logoi for the vocative. In the feminine first declension, we have in the nominative paidiske, then paidiskes for the genitive, and paidiskein for the uh, accusative singular, with paidiske again as the vocative. In the uh, first declension feminine plural, we have paidiskei, Pidescone, now Pidescas, and Pidescai. With the neuter second declension, we have Technon, Technu, and Technon, and Technon again for the vocative. And notice this is a, again a common pattern with neuter uh, nouns, both second declension and third declension, where we have a nominative form that is identical to the accusative form and is repeated again in the vocative form. So that makes the neuter forms really quite easy to remember, particularly because the genitive form is always the same as the masculine genitive uh, form.
The same pattern reappears for neuter nouns in the plural too. Tatekna is the nominative plural. Exactly the same form, tatekna, in the accusative, and tekna again as the vocative, with ton teknon being identical to the masculine second declension. Once again, before we look at the various kinds of third declension noun and how the endings work with them, we want to uh, take a look just at the standard third declension endings. Uh, this is the same list that we've seen before, but now we're adding the accusative in. So in the singular, with masculine and feminine uh, nouns in the singular, the nominative has no particular ending, genitive has os, and the accusative has alpha, a as its uh, uh, masculine and feminine ending. And the vocative, again, uh, has no particular ending. It's usually just the real stem. Uh, in the neuter, uh, things are almost identical, except that, remember, uh, neuter nouns always use the same forms in the nominative and vocative. And they also use that same form in the accusative. So in the accusative singular, there's no particular uh, ending for neuter nouns because the accusative singular is always going to be the same as the nominative singular. So that saves you uh, memorizing very many forms uh, for neuter third declension nouns. The one thing to remember here though is that the alpha ending uh, in the accusative for masculine and feminine third declension nouns can look like the alpha ending for neuter plural nouns. Um, this is why it's important to remember the gender of the word you're looking at, because if it's a third declension noun and it's masculine or feminine, an alpha ending is going to mean accusative singular. If it's third declension neuter, uh, an alpha ending is going to mean uh, one of a number of plural forms. If we look at the plurals, uh, again, in the masculine and feminine uh, nominative plural, the ending is s, genitive ending is own. Now the accusative ending is as, alpha sigma. And that is going to look a little bit like the first declension uh, accusative plural ending that we just learned. So you just have to remember that even though it looks first declension, uh, and so you might think this is a, a first declension feminine type ending, um, the third declension nouns masculine and feminine use that same as uh, ending in their accusative plural. And the vocative, again, is the same as the nominative s. In the neuter, uh, there really isn't anything more to learn here except to remember that in the neuter plural, the accusative form is once again the same as the nominative and vocative. That was an alpha in the nominative and vocative plural, and so in the accusative, it's an alpha again. Uh, that means, by the way, that with third declension neuter nouns, you often have to infer from context exactly what case the plural uh, noun is. And again, the point on this slide isn't to remember uh, all of these forms or to memorize them all, but just to notice how we uh, form the real stem of different types of third declension nouns in different ways and that all we have to do is plug those standard uh, accusative endings onto the real stem of the third declension noun. So with the ampelone type, once again, we're attaching the ending right onto the uh, nominative singular form, which is the real stem. So the accusative is ampelona in the singular and ampelonas in the accusative plural. Uh, with irregular nouns like gunaik, again, all we have to do is remember what that irregular real stem is, and uh, we get the accusative singular form gunaika and the accusative plural form gunaikas. With the mater type, words like pater, uh, the accusative uh, keeps the short epsilon in before the row. Uh, that short epsilon, remember, had dropped out in patros, and so we get in the accusative singular patera, but that's just the real uh, stem of pater anyway. And so in the accusative plural, also we get pateros. The pneuma type are usually neuter, and so in the 
uh, accusative forms, we're going to use the same form as the nominative. So that means that the real stem isn't going to show up in the uh, neuter uh, accusative singular. Uh, we are going to use the pneuma that we used for the nominative for the accusative as well, instead of pneumat. So the accusative singular is pneuma. The accusative plural then again is the same as the nominative plural and vocative plural, uh, but this time we do have the real stem pneumat with the alpha uh, plural ending. So just like the nominative uh, plural was pneumata, the accusative plural too will be pneumata. Moving on to the pis type of third declension noun, the stem, if you remember, is pied, and so the accusative singular is paida, and the accusative plural is paidas. In the polis type, though, uh, just like we had some uh, irregularity in the genitive singular with paleos, we're going to have some irregularity in the accusative singular. And in fact, the ending that the polis type uses in the accusative singular is a nu instead of the regular alpha. So instead of polea, the accusative singular of polis is polin. Um, you'll see polis type nouns a lot, so you'll get used to this, but this is one of the few uh, real irregularities that uh, you can't explain based on uh, vowel combinations. In the plural, the uh, accusative plural form is for some reason the same as the nominative plural form. So polis type nouns act as if they're neuter, even though they're not, um, reusing the polis form from the nominative and vocative. The same thing happens in the hierius type. In the singular, the hierius type uh, reverts to a more uh, regular form. So we just have the alpha ending again. Uh, we just have to remember that the epsilon of the real stem comes before it, so it's antiochea. Uh, but like the polis type, the uh, contracted ace ending shows up in the accusative uh, plural as well as the nominative and vocative plural, antiochus. The genos type is uh, quite uh, predictable. In uh, both the accusative singular and accusative plural, you use the same form as the nominative. So the nominative singular is genos, therefore the accusative singular is also genos. Uh, the nominative plural is gene, which remember is a contraction of gene plus the alpha ending. Uh, and so the accusative plural is also gene. Uh, with the ichthus type though, in the singular we uh, return to the new ending that showed up with the polis type. Don't ask me why it shows up in just these two uh, types of nouns, but the accusative singular of ichthus is going to be ichthun. Uh, but in the plural, the ichthus type uh, is regular again. We have the standard as ending attached to the real stem, and so we have ichthuas. Once again, don't try and memorize all of these forms, all of these lists. Um, just remember the standard third declension endings for the accusative, and then uh, try and keep in mind the couple of uh, uh, third declension types that have real irregularities. And uh, for the accusative, that's really just the polis type and the ichthus type that use these uh, new uh, endings in the singular and uh, the polis and hierius types uh, use the same form in the accusative that they do in the nominative. But what is the meaning of the accusative case? Again, it's to identify the direct object of the verb. English identifies the direct object with word order. The subject precedes the verb, and the object, the direct object, follows the verb. So the man is eating bread. Bread follows the verb eating, so we assume that it's the object of the eating, where the man is the subject because it precedes the verb. If we said bread is eating the man, that different word order would mean something completely different.
In the case of Greek, though, Greek identifies the object again not with word order, which is flexible, but with case endings. So these three sentences mean the same thing. Ha anthropos eche karpon, where ha anthropos, because it's nominative, uh, modifies the verb to provide the subject, and karpon, because it's accusative, uh, modifies the verb to provide the object. So the basic idea is he has, who has, ha anthropos, and uh, what is it that he has? Karpon, fruit. But we can rearrange the words and retain exactly the same meaning because the cases identify the same relationships between these words and the uh, verb. Karpon eche ha anthropos. Ha anthropos is still modifying the verb to provide the subject, and karpon is still providing the object for the verb. Likewise, if we put the verb first, eche karpon ha anthropos. Karpon, since it's accusative, still provides the direct object, and ha anthropos, since it's nominative, still provides the subject. You can see now why it's helpful to think about uh, Greek uh, clauses by starting with the verb and working our way outward then, asking what uh, is providing an explicit subject if there is a, a nominative, then asking if there's a direct object, looking for an accusative uh, now. now, before we leave the accusative case, we need to look at the accusative forms of some of the personal pronouns. So the pronoun ego, I, the first person singular personal pronoun, uh, in the genitive, if you remember, it became mu, or sometimes emu. Uh, and in the accusative, we get an odd irregular form, uh, which is me, or emme. And if you can remember that this just looks like the English me, um, that might help. Uh, but me is the accusative form of ego. Uh, the second person singular su, if you remember, it became su with an omicron upsilon in the genitive. So the genitive of both of these looks uh, like a second declension noun. But again, uh, the accusative form of su is se with just that epsilon ending again. And in the vocative, of course, uh, the form is the same as the nominative. The plural uh, personal pronouns, heimes and humes, are quite a bit easier because they just take the regular third declension endings. So uh, for we, heimes, in the genitive we have heimon, and then the accusative we have that as ending that's typical of the third declension, heimas. Similarly, with humes, you plural, uh, we had humon in the genitive and humas in the accusative. We've already seen uh, the third declension case endings, and so we don't need to say very much about the case endings for tis and ti, except to note that they're perfectly regular. For the masculine and feminine, we have tina. Uh, in the singular, and in the accusative we have tinas. And uh, notice again with the neuter, the same pattern that we saw before. The neuter accusative forms are the same as the neuter nominative forms. So the accusative singular neuter is t, just like the nominative, and the uh, accusative plural neuter is tina, just like the nominative tina. Pas, uh, is a little bit uh, irregular in the accusative singular, although it's fairly easy to remember. Um, the accusative singular for masculine uh, uses the new instead of the alpha ending and uh, uses the shortened stem that we saw in the nominative. So it's pas, nominative, pantos, and then pan again, and pas for the vocative. Uh, the feminine first declension uh, accusative ending is uh, totally regular, pasan. And then the neuter, again, the accusative singular is the same as the nominative singular, pan. That means that the accusative singular uh, of the masculine and the neuter forms are the same. They're both pan. 
In the plural, things become uh, perfectly regular. So in the accusative plural, we have pantas for the masculine, pasas for the feminine, and panta for the neuter, which again is the same as the nominative plural form. The accusative forms for polus, which means much or many, are fairly easy if you can remember the slight irregularity in the nominative singular forms. So remember that the r regular stem for polus is actually Paul with a double lambda. And in the plural forms, uh, the accusative just uses that regular stem Paul plus the uh, regular first and second declension plural endings for the accusative. So Paulus in the masculine, Paulas in the feminine, and Paula in the neuter. It's in the singular that we have a little bit of irregularity again. And the feminine form, just like in the nominative, is the regular one. We have the regular stem plus the ain ending for the first declension feminine singular. But in the masculine singular, we still have the, the new ending, but the stem and connecting vowel change to this irregular one that we see in the nominative form polus. So instead of uh, polon with a double lambda, the masculine accusative singular is polun with a single lambda. If you can remember that the nominative masculine singular is polus, uh, then you might be able to remember that the nominative uh, accusative, or, sorry, accusative masculine singular uh, is also irregular, paloon. And in the neuter, things are even easier because uh, the accusative is usually the same in the neuter as the nominative form. And so the nominative form that was irregular, palu in the neuter singular, uh, is used again in the neuter accusative singular, palu. Likewise with megas, the masculine accusative singular is megan, using the short stem. Uh, the feminine accusative singular is megalain, totally regular. The neuter accusative singular is mega, identical to the nominative singular. And in the accusative plural, we have totally regular forms megalus, megalas, and megala. You can learn more about the Greek cases and the accusative case in particular in Mounts' Basics of Biblical Greek, and I've provided once more the section and page numbers for the third edition.